And so, uh, yes, I'm Adrian. Uh, I organize this meetup. We've been doing it for several years. We do several things, including talks like this one by uh, people like Sergey, who have interesting opinions and interesting projects. So, um, and that might be somebody wanting to be let in the door. So, uh, yep, it is. All so, right. Uh, so, um, I will be talking about my uh, project that I started a couple of months ago. And um, now I'm kind of happy and satisfied with this current beta state or alpha state. So I can present what it can do. Uh, the, the main goal of this project is to generate code for Scala functions based on their types. So um, I want to do a lot of live coding to illustrate how this works. And uh, the main thing that it, it uses is the curry Howard correspondence. So I'd like to ask you how many of you don't know enough about curry Howard correspondence to understand why it could be useful for generating code from types. Okay. Um, so I will give an introduction to curry Howard correspondence. So that was about half uh, of the people. Um, uh, so, let me then um, start with an uh, introduction to what query howard correspondence is. Um, when we have code in the program, so, oh, I needed to also ask how many people are familiar with Scala? Uh, so, pretty much everyone except three people, or you, you two, two people. All right, so this will be all examples will be in Scala, uh, but hopefully easy enough to understand for people familiar with functional programming. So suppose you have code um, like this in the, your in your program. So that means that at some well, assuming that this code compiles and runs, of course, this means you have been able to compute a value of type t in this program. At this place. Um, so this is a proposition that your program can compute for your code has value of type t. And let's denote this proposition by ch of t. So um, that means code has value of type t. Doesn't matter which value, just some value of type t. Now this proposition could be true or false for a given program and for a given type t because your program might not be able to compute values of certain types because those need some other values of some other types and the program doesn't get them. Uh, so, so this could be true or false. Uh, now, the curry howard correspondence is this correspondence between types and propositions. So types such as integer, float, array of integer, and other types like this, corresponds to propositions. Code has value of this type. Um, now, these propositions could be true or false given for a given type and for a given program. So here's an illustration of why this correspondence is interesting and uh, productive. So the reason is that if you have types like you have in most functional languages, like in Scala, you have a tuple type. Uh, if your program has computed a tuple type, uh, a, b, it means that you have computed the value of a, and also you have computed the value of b. Otherwise, you cannot make a tuple type. Now, if you translate that into propositions, that becomes that you have ch of a, and also you have ch of b. So this be becomes a logical conjunction of the two propositions. So in this table, I have summarized what happens so on the left you have Scala syntax of different types these are type expressions and here there are logical propositions or formulas in the logic and here there are the same formulas but in the short notation um, if you have an either of a b uh, that means you have computed an a maybe or maybe a b but you don't know which necessarily um, so it means in the logic that the proposition ch of a or the proposition ch of b are true. Um, 
Now, if you have a function from A to B in your Scala code, that doesn't really mean you have an A or that you have a B. But it means that if somebody were to give you an A, value of type A, and you would be able to apply that function and produce a value of type B. Which means that if CH of A is true, then CH of B is true. So this is an implication in the logic. Um, finally, the unit type uh, can always be computed. It does not need any other data to be computed. So this corresponds to a proposition that is always true for every program. It is a true proposition, identically true. And the nothing type is a type that you cannot compute. You can never compute a value of this type. So that is a proposition CH of nothing is identically false in all programs. So now you see that different types in Scala or in another functional language, for that <coughs> matter, most of today's functional languages have the same constructions of product, uh, uh, sum or uh, disjunction, implication or function type, unit, and nothing. So in the logic, these are the basic fundamental logical operations. And so because you have all of these operations in the logic and in your program, it means that any logical formula corresponds to some type, and any type corresponds to some logical formula. So in this way, you have a one-to-one -one correspondence of a sort, where you, uh, you have formulas in the logic and types in the program. And when you have uh, a certain formula, which could be much more complicated than just this, it can, corresponds to a type expression that could be much more complicated than this. Now, I use a short notation, which I want to talk to about uh, uh, briefly. So what is this short notation? Well, I use logical symbols like conjunction and, um, um, sorry, I'm in your way, right? It's, it's, it's fine. I can, I can look around the side. Don't yes, worry about me. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, so conjunction is usually denoted like this. Now, I also use this symbol, which is a product. And disjunction is denoted like this. I also use the symbol plus. And I prefer to use the plus and product when I talk about types. And uh, the conjunction and disjunction when I talk about logical formulas. Um, implication is like this. True is 1, false is 0. So this would be the short notation for the types. Uh, now, in Scala, you also can have type parameters. Now, type parameters uh, in logic means that something is true for any type T. So for any proposition T, some formula is true. And here's an example. Imagine this function, which is uh, uh, to duplicate a value. So you have to take a value of type A and return a tuple of AA um, by simply repeating this value twice. Now, in the logic, the type of this function corresponds to this formula, where all a from a follows a and a. Now, this is a true formula. This is a theorem. It is true that for all a, if, you are, if a is true, then a and a also is true. So that's not, not a very interesting, perhaps, uh, theorem, but it is valid. It is true. And... Um, so you see, you can, you can write code of this function, and that corresponds to a true theorem. And in fact, this is generally true. So this is the first thing that we notice, uh, is that any valid theorem, any, any formula that is a theorem, corresponds to some type that can be implemented. So here are some examples. For all A, from A follows A. Now, this is obviously true. Uh, well, this is an axiom in the logic in any case. Um, and this corresponds to the identity function, which takes an, a value x of type A and returns the same value x. So the type of this function is A to A for all A. Uh, another example is from A to true. Now this is taking any value of type A returning unit. Well, not a very interesting function, but nevertheless, um, here's a more interesting one, perhaps, from A to A plus B. Now, this is um, 
um, taking an A and returning an either of AB. So then, you obviously, you cannot make a B out of A, so you must return the left always, but so what? You are satisfying the type. So that's it. Here, another one is taking a tuple of AB, returning A. So that is just taking the first element of the tuple. And here's another one, taking an A and returning a function from B to A. Now, this is a little more interesting. It's a function that takes an A, returns a function that takes any kind of B, any kind of Y of type B, and uh, ignores that Y and returns the X that was given initially. So that is a higher order function, uh, or if you prefer it, a curried function. But again, so we have this logical formula that is true, and we have a function that can be implemented. And most, in most interestingly, uh, if you have a formula that is not true, you cannot implement its type. So here's an example. Uh, for all A, from 1 follows A. Well, that is obviously not true, because what if A is false? It, it cannot follow from truth. Um, now, try to produce a code in Scala that takes a unit as an argument and returns um, arbitrary uh, A. You can't. There's no way to make it. You don't know what the type A is, so you can't make it. S another example, from A plus B to into A, so from, from the either type, uh, either A, B, uh, produce an A. You again cannot do this, because what if this either doesn't contain an A, it contains a B. Uh, so there's, a, there's no way to do it. Another is from A, produce A times B, again, impossible. Another one is from A to B, produce A. This is a bit more difficult to understand, maybe, but you don't have an A still. You have a function from A to B, so you're trying to wait for somebody to give you an A, but nobody's going to give you an A, and uh, you're, you're required to produce an A yourself, and you can't. Um, so these are invalid formulas, or non-theorems, uh, that you cannot derive in the logic, and at the same time, these are types of functions that you cannot implement. So then there is this interesting correspondence that not only types correspond to formulas in some nebulous logic, but if you can prove the formula to be true, to be a true theorem, then you can write code for the function. And if you cannot write code for the function, you cannot write the, the, the proof of the formula and vice versa. If you cannot prove the formula, then you cannot write the code for the function. So these are equivalent. So this is a second side of the correspondence. Not only the types correspond to formulas, but proofs of the formulas correspond to code. In other, well, so far we haven't seen how it works. We will see it a bit later in this presentation. So there's a natural question that is, if I give you a type or a formula, how can you implement it in code? Uh, here's an example, okay? So here it is, all right? So go ahead and, and write code for this function. Uh, it's not obvious. So how can we decide? How can we decide that this is even possible? And since I know this, I've gone through this, if you, dis if you just substitute one of these A's by a B, it becomes impossible. Uh, so again, why? So what, how do you know this? Um, so luckily, there exists an algorithm for deciding this. So this logic in which I'm working, I did not talk very much about the logic so far, I will. It's called intuitionistic propositional logic, which has a decision procedure. In other words, there's an algorithm that takes a formula in this logic as a symbolic expression and does some computation on that symbolic expression and decides whether you can prove it. And if so, produces a proof. And if not, then it shows you why you cannot prove it. Um, it's not just that you couldn't manage to prove it, but you actually know that it's impossible. So it's a real complete decision procedure. Um, and uh, the byproduct of this decision procedure is that you have uh, proof for the formula translated, that can be translated into code for your function. 
and I will show how, how that works. But first, let us have a little practice, maybe, uh, implementing uh, code from types. Uh, I will go through this very quickly. Um, I'm using the ammonite shell, which is very nice, because um, I can very easily import libraries from Maven. For example, this line, import dollar blah 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 blah, it will download, if necessary, a library from the Maven repository with this Scala version and so on, and at the same time will import symbols from that library. So I already have it in the cache, so it doesn't have to download, but it will if necessary. So the first example is that we want to implement this function of this type. So let's see. Uh, I need type parameters, A, B, E, and I need to implement this function. So how would I implement this function? Uh, well, let me, uh, let me edit this a little for readability, copying from PDF. OK, now it's more readable. So how do I implement this function? <laughs> Well, obviously, <coughs> I'm supposed to produce a function from this E to A. So let's produce that. So this would be of type E to A. Then I'm supposed to produce a function from A to B to something. OK, let's write that. And then I'm supposed to produce a function from E to B. OK, from E. And now I'm supposed to produce a B. If I pr can produce a value of type B right now in this line, I'm done. How do I make a B? Well, I don't have a B, but I have A to B. If I could produce an A, I would use this A, B on this A, and I would have a B. How do I get an A? Well, I don't have an A, but I have an E to A. So I can use E to A on something of type E to get an A. Well, where is something of type E? I have it. It's right here. So now I'm done. So uh, this is the way I write code. So this, some people say this is type-directed programming, where you start with types that you need, and you kind of derive what the code must be. So let's look at the second example. Now here, if I wanted to implement this, I would do the same thing. I need an A. I don't have an A, and I have E to A. I would have to apply E to A to something, but I don't have an E. I have an E to F, and I'm stuck. So in this example, I'm st stuck trying to get a value of type F, for which I need an E, and then I can't get it. And the third example is to implement this, which is a map function for the option. So let's call it map option. Uh, so here, what can I do? Well, obviously, I get an option. So let's call it OA. I have an AB. And then what? I can match an OA. And I have two cases. So sum of some x. So that is of type A. Now I can use. A, B of this A, I got a B, I put it into a sum, and I get an option B. And then obviously case none goes to none. Ah? Maybe S Sorry, I, you're right, that was an X. Nice editor. Um, so, now, note I could do it in a different way. I could just here return none and ignore that stuff. And that also has this right type. It compiles. But it's a kind of useless function. I ignored all my arguments, and I just return none always. It's kind of useless. And also, it loses information. So I, I, I had the information, I just ignored it. So, um, Looking at these examples, 
we see two things. First of all, often there's just one useful implementation. You just look at the type, and you have one implementation. And uh, sometimes you have none. And sometimes you have more, but one of them is more useful than others because it doesn't lose information. So why do you want to not lose information? Well, if you're familiar with uh, what the map function is supposed to do, how many of you know what that should be? Uh, yeah, pretty much everybody. If you know what, what the map function should do, it shouldn't lose information. It should satisfy equations such as identity law. And if it loses information, you won't satisfy identity law uh, or uh, composition law. And so obviously functions like something that always returns none wouldn't be very useful for those applications. So if there's only one implementation, why don't I use the computer to give it to me? Why do I have to do this? I mean, it looks like I'm just following the type. I have no freedom. And I'm just doing my motions. And why do I do this? So why don't I just put, you know, click a button? And uh, that's what I can do, indeed. Here's a here's line. All right. Uh, I just do this. Let's pull this. Let's copy this over there. Done. Same thing. You can use it. This map, you can use it. Like val reader a uh, int to string equals to string plus abc. All right, what is ra of one, two, three is correct. Now let's map this from integer to Boolean. Okay, and uh, it's the map of uh, reader A and the function, well, let's call this map of, so function from integer, from, from string to Boolean, right? And this function from string to Boolean, what would it be? Like it would be S uh, starts with, one let's say let's call this okay we got something right that's it's an integer to boolean now let's apply this rest nine right the rest nine which i got right here let's apply this rest nine to this what do we get it's true because that started with one right so it works what did i do i just said implement Right here, I, I write the type of my function and I say implement. That's that's all. So that's so that's one interface, one API that the library provides. Another API is called of type. So this is an illustration of of type. Now of type is different because it has extra. It can have extra arguments. So in, here's the situation: we have a case class which has an int and a string, and you're supposed to produce a value of this case class. Um, and you're given f, which is a function of funny type signature from string to boolean to int. You're given a string, and you're given a boolean, and you're given an f. So how do you get result out of it? Well, let's find out. For result, you need an integer and a string. Well, we already have a string. How do we get an integer? Well, we need a string and a boolean to get an integer. So we have a string already, and we have a boolean. Excellent. So we can just juggle them together and call the function and the right arguments somehow and get the case class that we want. And that's what it does. So it's deriving, it's, it's a shortcut to first defining a function from all these types to result and then calling that function on these arguments. So it's a shortcut to saying first define some auxiliary function of type uh, string, then this, and then boolean to result equals implement, and then call that function on these three values. So instead of writing that, if you just want it once in expression, so you don't want to define functions that you would use many times, you just need an expression in the middle of your code. Then you just say of type. You, you know you can get it from other things. So you just say what type you want and from what things you want to get it. And uh, you can use of type without arguments too, if, that's, if that works. 
Um, let me let me try, uh, uh, for example, like this. Okay, so I get uh, id int, which is an identity of type integer to integer. I hope. So why identity? Well, what what other function are we going to have? So Curry Howard library uh, treats all types as type parameters. It doesn't know anything about integers, about strings or booleans. So just you give it an integer. That's just a fancy name for some type parameter. And so uh, it won't produce anything except an identity function in this example. Um, and that's probably what you wanted. Uh, so, I mean, if you're tel telling me the type is integer to integer, how am I to guess what you want? Uh, there are so many functions from integer to integer. Question? I'm just curious, what happens if you run it with like a really complicated type from like a real world library? Like, yeah. like maybe like, instead of of type in, in like of type, then like the spray JSON, JSON types or something. It would still yeah. do the same thing? So, uh, I think so. It's just that if it's identity, it will note that they're identical types. If it's a complicated type, it won't try to think about it. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe it was, that's what you want. Uh, so, like, let me see. Uh, future of sequence of uh, try of right of yeah. string. One, two, three, four. We are going to future of sequence of try of string. One, two, three, four. Poof. What happened? Ah, uh -huh, uh -huh. yes. Uh, future Scala util try. All right. Let's try again. Something is wrong. Uh, Maybe the REPL doesn't like do the no, use. No, it does. Where is the future? It, it did input, right? What is not found exactly? Type. Oh. Future. I'm not sure what that means here. Not found? What exactly is not found? Uh, Future of sequence of. You're missing a square bracket on the left side of the object. Am I? Am I? One. One. The whole thing is supposed to be in front of the end. So, and so three. Yeah. So, yeah. Three. Sorry. No, I don't think I'm missing. Oh, never mind. Yeah. Something, is, something else is wrong. Well, it's a typical demo effect. <laughs> Something else, why is it not finding type future? Sorry, what is this? Is it is it underfound sequence? Sorry? Is it underfound sequence? Is that in the found in namespace? Let me get rid of the future. Let me just I'll try to get future. Sorry? What? Uh, could you what happens if you try future string? Yes, I will try that. We can't find the try and in the future was okay. Let me try this sequence string to sequence string first. Something is something is fishy here. It can't find types. Uh, all right, I will have to investigate this, try but, qualifying. sorry? Try qualifying sequence. How? Ah, you like writing up exactly this? But it's, I, it found it, it says it can't find. Does, does it definitely work with parameterized types? Like if you did it with type vectors, you just had f of string to f of string, does that work? f has to be defined. Okay, I will. I don't know why, but sometimes things don't work in Ammonite that work in uh, actual compiler. Uh, I will find out. This is uh, perhaps too ambitious for this demo. But uh, 
Certainly, certainly parametrized types work if you define them. Right? Let me see. This certainly works, for example, like this. And then I want to define map on this, uh, which is, let's say, R of T, T U, R U, implement. Done. Uh, and let me see if of type works. Uh, of type of this works. And look at what it said returning term. Right? So this is a lambda calculus term that it returns. So that is a hint about what's going on here. So what, what's happening is that I'm, uh, so this macro, this is a macro, this is a macro uh, of type and implement uh, our macros. They examine your type that you're given as a syntax tree, as a type expression. And they then convert that to a logic formula and try to find a proof of that logic formula using the logical rules of derivation and logical axioms. And when the proof is found, they convert the proof back into code using lambda calculus. So how many of you are familiar with lambda calculus? Quite a few people, almost everyone. So uh, in the library, the features right now are implemented are that I support all the standard types, case classes, function types, type parameters. I support type aliases, uh, constant types I support it. And if there are several implementations available, like for example, option to option, option A to option A, right? So what option A to option A should be an identity. If you, if you generate a function of type option A to option A, that should be an identity. So that uh, could be uh, seen as some kind of heuristic, which it is. Um, that tries to find out what is the best intention for your function to meet. Um, so here is a, a bunch more examples. So for example, you can implement the distributive law, which is the isomorphism between these two types written in a short notation. Now you see why I prefer to use uh, arithmetic notation for types rather than logical notation because then it becomes obvious what that means. Uh, it's just the arithmetic identity for the uh, type cardinalities. And uh, obviously, if this is true, then types are isomorphic and vice versa. <coughs> um, now, uh, if you write this in a logical notation, it becomes a jumble of wedges and inverted wedges, which you have to unjumble, and that's confusing. Uh, so implementing these isomorphisms is a breeze. You just write these types like either a, b, comma c as a tuple going to either of tuple a, c, tuple b, c equals implement, done. Uh, so types like this work very well. What doesn't work very well right now is, well, I've, you have seen maybe some more complicated things uh, with library types. But also what doesn't work very well is when you have a lot of nested options in your type, like option of option of option of option of option going to something. There's so many different ways in which to ignore things there, to take a none out of here, to take a none out of here. And it's very hard to, first of all, to enumerate all the possible proofs. It can take a while, becomes slow. And then to choose the one that is the best, that becomes a difficult problem. And sometimes it, it fails on other examples like this. So, so Another example that is questionable is tuple AA to tuple AA. So did you want to preserve the order or not? Uh, the type doesn't tell you this. So these are ambiguous things. So as you realize, types are not enough to specify code. In some cases, they are. In those cases, you just say equals implement and you're done. And if, if you don't, uh, if you don't have a proof, well, let's implement this. Uh, suppose I made uh, uh, 
this uh, attempt to implement this type parameters are a e f equals implement poof cannot be implemented it says now cannot be implemented means that it has proved that there is no implementation this this type is not inhabited and you cannot possibly write code of this type so there's no it's not that you know I told you, well, I can't, can't come up with an E to substitute into something, right? Maybe I'm not clever enough. How do I know? No, actually, that's not true. Uh, there is no implementation. So there is a, there's a certainty here. It's an exhaustive proof search. What will, will it try to do in the, um, the tuple of A to tuple of A example you mentioned? Will it yeah. just end up doing identity, or will it tell you I can't make an intelligent decision? Uh, let's see. No, it will, it will give uh, an identity function, I hope. Uh, yes. Mm. How, so, did you, how did you choose that over swap? So, actually, okay, so actually I expected it to work, but it didn't. Um, so, it, it says that there, uh, it can be implemented in two inequivalent ways, and it it has a score, which is a heuristic, and the score is equal for these two. So I've played it quite a long time with these scores and how to figure out. So your question was, how does it choose which one if there are several? Now, obviously, uh, you don't, it doesn't know what you want. So there are ways of going around this. And one way is to say, give me all of these, and then I'll run some runtime tests and, and choose what I want. So that's another thing that you can do. In fact, uh, that's uh, available right now as an API called all of type. And all of type gives you a sequence of two functions which uh, implement the two possibilities. And uh, if you want to choose between them based on whatever requirements you have, then you can do it at one time. I haven't yet figured out how to do this at compile time. Uh, how you? Why are these two cases where it takes the first term twice so the second Ah. Uh, so the question is, why didn't it consider uh, returning, ignoring one of the tuple elements and re returning the other one twice? The answer is that loses information. Uh, so that has a higher. Uh, information loss score. This score is information loss. So it's, it's more lossy because you ignore part of what you are given. And this doesn't ignore it. So uh, another part of score that I uh, implemented, but maybe this is, I'm not sure, uh, is not, not doing what I expected, but I, I played with it that it tries to preserve the ordering of things in tuples. Now, this may not be what you want. I'm not sure it's a good heuristic, but it sounded good at the time when I was implementing it. Anyway, um, so uh, I have a lot of tests for this library, and in the tests I implement a lot of monadic functions like flat map and map and, and so on for a bunch of standard monads like state, uh, continuation, uh, reader, and... Um, all of that just works because the types are very tight. They are constraining very highly. So I'm not going to show you test code right now, but you're welcome to check it out. It's basically writing down the type signature and saying equals implement. So you can easily imagine what that is like. And then, of course, you can check laws using Scala check at runtime if you want. Now, I will show you. Uh, an experimental API where I actually get lambda terms out of these and I can do symbolic checking, uh, which might be interesting to many of you here uh, because that's kind of uh, already getting to the, to the point where we can do interesting things, uh, even though it's still at runtime. Um, so very briefly, how this all works. So the logic is represented by um, 
rules of derivation and axioms. Now, in this presentation of logic, I just have rules of derivation. I don't have axioms. Uh, and the rules are written in this notation, uh, the strange thing here, sequence. Uh, so these are called sequence. So this is a sequence. So what is a sequence? It is uh, a number of formulas on the left. Then there's this turnstile symbol. And then there's a number of formulas. On, uh, there's one formula on the right in this, in this logic. Uh, so formulas to the left are premises. This is what we assume to be already proven. proved. Uh, so each of the formulas on the left are already proved. And on the right is what we want to prove. Um, and so the sequence is a proof, a proof task uh, of, a, of sorts. And uh, each rule here looks like this uh, fraction with something in the numerator and something in the denominator. Or to the right of the fraction is just a name. So this R implication or left implication, right implication. These are just names. They don't do anything. They're just labels to say which rule I'm talking about. But the rule is this fraction. So in the, in the numerator, there's one or more sequence. In the denominator, there's one sequence. So what does it mean? <coughs> it means if the sequence at the top are already proved, then you can prove the sequence at the bottom. So logic is specified by giving you a number of these rules. And then some of these rules have nothing at, at top. And like the first two rules here, they have nothing at the top. And so they are axioms. They give you something you can prove with no premises. Uh, sorry, with no previous sequence. Uh, premises, you always have premises. Although here you can prove truth with no premises. So gamma is anything. Gamma is kind of uh, notation for any, any number, zero or more premises. So this is gamma. Uh, now, this notation is extremely dense. So there are all these conventions, like what is gamma, and what are, what are these things on top of them, and so on. Extremely dense notation that is very hard to, to read and to write. Uh, yes? Um, what, is it necessary to write gamma in all these cases? It looks like pretty much every single one has gamma in it. Yes. So it is necessary because you need to say that, for example, uh, well, here, here's an example. You want to prove that A or B is true. And for this, you need to prove this and this. So in both of them, you can use the premises from here. So you show that you need, the, you, you take some premises uh, and you duplicate them over here. So um, if you remove gamma, then it would not be clear that uh, this sequence at the bottom has actually different premises. It, it can have one or more different premises. Um, or, or the sequence in, in this rule. Uh, here you, you say, if you want to prove this, then you should have proved this and this. And gamma is repeated. So the fact that it is repeated is important. You're, you're showing which premises you're copying from one sequence to another and which premises you're not copying. You're replacing them with new premises. So that's why gamma is written. Uh, and, and there might be a sequence where you take something out of gamma and replace it or not, and so on. So that's, that's, why, it's, that's why it's written. So basically, um, gamma stands for one or more arbitrary premises. Uh, the way we use this to prove, to, to prove things is we start from the bottom to top, from the bottom of each rule. So we say, we have a formula, and this formula has, uh, here's an example. Uh, we want to prove this formula, OK? Uh, which means that we have no premises. So we have an empty set. So gamma is an empty set. So I write an empty set to the left. And then we want to prove this. So how do we prove this? Well. We look at what rules would apply. So what is so we do bottom up. We look at each rule. At the bottom of each rule, there is something that we can prove if something else were to be proved. So which rule matches this at the bottom? Now it is this rule, the R, the right implication, which means there's an implication at the right of the sequence. Uh, so we use that rule. 
So here's a, here's a proof. We take the first sequent, which is this sequent, and we apply the rule R imp right implication. So right implication means now we have to prove this gamma comma A goes to B. Now what is A and B? Well, A is this R to R to Q, and B is Q. So then we have the sequent R to R to Q uh, goes to Q. And so now we look at sequent S1. So what rules apply to it? Well, the rule left implication applies to it. Because now left implication is the only rule that can do something when you have a premise on the left that has an implication. Now I put this in blue. So in blue are the interesting parts. And you match on what is on, on, on the left with the blue or on the right with the blue. So you apply the rule uh, left implication and you get two sequence because this rule it requires you to prove two sequence. Now if you put B and C where they belong, then B is R to R or, or, or Q or something, C is Q, so you have two sequence. One is Q to Q and one is this. So this is the new sequent S2 and this is a new sequent S3. Now, sequence S3 is easy. It just follows from the first axiom, from, from this. X goes to X with no pr other premises. So S3 is done, but this one is not done. So what, did, what do we do with this? Well, we again, look, what can we apply? Well, we can apply again the left implication. So, because we have an implication on the left. So we get two more sequence, S4 and S5. Now, S5 we might be able to prove, but S4 is again the same sequence as S2, you see? And that's the problem, because we are now going in a circle. To prove S2, we need to prove S2. So we will never get anything in this way. Now we scratch our heads and say, uh, we probably need to backtrack now. We didn't do the right rule. Let's try another rule. So we erase what we did, we erase S4 and S5. We're back to here, to S2 and S3. S3 is proven, S2 is not. Now we apply the rule R implication, right implication. So we get a new sequence, and that sequence follows from the identity axiom because it has R and R on both sides, so we ignore all those things, and we have proven it. So that's it. So that concludes the proof of the sequent, uh, which is S0 at the top. So this is how it works. So you kind of try to find what proof, what rule matches your expression, and you decom each rule decomposes this expression a bit more, and gives you more expressions to prove, but these are kind of simpler. They have maybe more parts, but the parts are simpler. And then you again apply, so you de at each step you decompose things, because if you look at the rules, they're always all of this sort. Each rule has more structure at the bottom than, than at the top. And yes? So I'm having a little trouble understanding the, the syntax for those yeah. for that, for that logical uh, language. Is, is there just one procedure for getting from like a start to finish, or are there different like search algorithms that you could use, and you just chose to use this one? So, OK. Um, yes, I, I should have said that um, this set of rules uh, so the question is, is there just one algorithm of getting a proof, or there are many? Um, there are many. And actually, it's very hard to come up with a set of rules like this. So there are many equivalent sets of rules like this. And each of them gives rise to a different kind of search tree, because they will decompose in different ways. and, and uh, so each of these sets of rules is called a calculus <coughs> by the by logicians, and <coughs> excuse me, and um, so this calculus is is due to Genten, and uh, this calculus is proved to be complete and and sound. So in other words, you, using these rules, you prove only the theorems that are valid and all the theorems that are valid. Um, but there are many other equivalent, complete and sound uh, calculi that are more complicated. This is a, maybe the simplest one for this logic. So this, this 
covers all our cases pretty much conjunction disjunction truth and implication so whatever type we have uh, containing disjunction conjunction truth and implication we can translate this into this uh, uh, notation and the calculus will give us the proof eventually yes uh, if we had elimination rules would the algorithm that you sketched for us terminate the question is if we had elimination rules will the algorithm terminate well I think we do have elimination rules yeah. well we eliminate uh, for example here we eliminate implication uh, now, the interesting rule is this one, the left 